from the book of Exodus. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the Pharaoh and his, and his officials changed their minds about them and said, what have we done? We've let the Israelites go and lost their services. So he had his chariot made ready and took his army with him. He took 600 of the best chariots, along with all the other chariots of Egypt, with officers over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, so that he pursued the Israelites who were marching out boldly. The Egyptians, and this is all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops, pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped by the sea near Hihahirot, opposite Baal Zephon. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up And there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, Leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Moses answered the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Then the Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning. It is really good to be with all of you today. Pray with me. Giver of life, here we are. The faithful, the doubters, the believers, the skeptical, the strong and the wounded, here we are. Somehow we belong to you. Thank you. In this time, God, revive us, energize us, not just for our own sake, but for the sake of this creation that you've made, that it might reflect your kingdom more and more every day. Amen. So as we come into this new year, um, we're always evaluating, taking inventory of what life is like, where our life has been, what we've been doing, what we've been up to, things that we want to change so we make those resolutions. Hopefully the resolutions you've made you're still tracking with right now. We're only a couple weeks in, people. But we pay attention to the rhythms of our life and the patterns of our life. And so I thought it would be fitting to take a look at a couple of patterns right now. So as you look at this pattern, and the ones I'm going to show you, I just just want you to get a sense of how it makes you feel. Don't judge it whether it's good, bad, right, or wrong. Just how does this make me feel? Sometimes patterns can soothe us. There's a predictability to them that gives us comfort. Sometimes patterns are a bit busy. Perhaps that is distracting, or perhaps a busy pattern keeps your mind quiet. We like to have patterns in our life to give us rhythm and routine so we can keep moving. Yet there are moments in life when those patterns become disrupted. Yeah. What were they thinking? It's so uncomfortable. I mean, the pattern is not that hard, people. Like, there's just these big colored squares. 
Yeah. So subtle. Just a small little misplacement of that pattern and the whole thing is off kilter. And so this morning, how are the patterns in your life? How are the rhythms in your life? And you might be thinking of specific patterns, like maybe your sleep pattern, or your eating rhythms, or your workout rhythms, or your workflow, whatever area of your life. Or you might be thinking more in a broader scope. How is the rhythm of my life going right now? There might be a bunch of areas in your life that are just moving along swimmingly. The patterns are in sync, you're in the flow, you're in the groove, but you can have one area in that great mosaic of your life that is just ever so slightly off kilter. And it doesn't stay compartmentalized, does it? It, it kind of affects the whole rhythm, the whole movement of life. We can have patterns in our life that are life-giving, give us joy, keep us moving. We can have patterns in our life that are unhealthy, disruptive. In fact, we can have patterns that are removed from us. It could be somebody else's pattern that gets in the way, throws us off sync. What are the patterns like in your life? When we find ourselves in a pattern, in a system where things aren't working, we have an opportunity. When we can't quite catch the vision for how things are going, we have an opportunity. And sometimes we're given clarity on how to move forward. Maybe there's something that we need to change in an area of our life because the, the rhythm isn't working, the pattern isn't working, but we have an idea, a clear vision for how we can get to where we want to go, and it energizes us. The pattern can still be off, but because we have a way forward, we're empowered to keep moving. We're not deterred. Oh. But what about those times and spaces when we don't have that clarity? When the pattern is not working and we don't know how to get it on track. When you don't know the way forward and you can't keep going the way it is. Have you been there before? Do you have loved ones that have been there or are there? That time and space when we can't keep going the way it is and we don't know the way forward can be excruciating. It can be maddening. And we begin to ask all sorts of questions about ourselves and the world around us. Questions like, will I get through this? What will life look like on the other side? Where is God? Does God care? Do I even believe in God? Maybe you've just pushed the whole God thing aside. Maybe you're just feeling like, am I going crazy? You're not alone. You're not alone. It's part of the human experience. But this lack of clarity and endless questions... The second guessing, it can be paralyzing. It can be suffocating to our life. This is the space that the Israelites find themselves in. in that narrative we just read. They don't know the way forward, and they can't keep going the way it is. What to do? Now, a quick word of transition here. Oftentimes when we approach the scripture and we're looking for some guidance or some way forward, we approach it with a prescriptive mindset. If I can just take the Bible and get to the right chapter and verse, it will tell me exactly what I need to do to keep moving. Sort of equation-based, very methodical, it's super linear. Sometimes scripture works that way for us. 
do this, not this. If you do this, then that. Great. And then it's like a code I have to unlock. But I'll tell you, more often than not, the scripture in our life is not intended to be prescriptive, but to be descriptive. To invite us into what the human experience with the divine is actually like. So that we can find comfort, so that we can find grounding, so that we can feel a little less crazy. So maybe for some of you as we approach scripture, we need to shift that mode from trying to prescribe everything out of it into our life to a little bit more of a descriptive mode. Because life is less an equation to be solved and more an experience to embrace. So in Exodus 4, 14, chapter 5 through 15, we see that the Israelites are stuck. They've gotten out of Egypt. They've got Pharaoh and his army chasing them, and they're at a crossroads. Now we have hindsight. We have the scripture to look back, and we know how the narrative goes. If you grew up in the church, you saw all the flannel graph of knowing how the Israelites are going to get past that large sea. Maybe you didn't grow up in the church, but you can think Charlton Heston, Talking Vegetables, and DreamWorks cartoons to let you know that the sea parts and the Israelites are on their way. They don't stay stuck forever. But see, in this narrative, it's not one fell swoop, is it? No, it's a series of moments, times, and spaces. And in this moment, for those Israelites, they are completely stuck. And I wouldn't say it's the lack of faith that keeps them stuck. I think it's their humanity. Like, we can do all the math here. We can't go forward. We can't really fight and go back. If we go back, we're going to be enslaved, and maybe that's better than dying out here. They're doing the logic the best they can. For those Israelites, in that moment, without having foresight to know what will happen, it must have been suffocating. Those hours must have felt like days gathered around the fire, having the children, Mom, Dad, are we going to be okay? And not have answers for them. To try to keep a brave face. It must have been excruciating. Again, can you identify when the pattern has been disrupted? So verse 10, it says, As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. When we are stuck, when we can't keep going the way it is, and we don't know the way forward, If you feel like crying out, if you feel like screaming, if you feel like you're on the brink of losing your mind, you're in good company. The people of God have been doing this for generations. They cry out. They cry out because there's need, because there's longing, because it's not working, and they're at the end of their resources. Be encouraged today that if you're at the end of your resources, you are not alone. And if you do currently know the way forward for the pattern of your life, rest assured there will be a time and space when the way forward gets fuzzy again. But you will not be alone. It's okay to cry out. It's what the people of God do It's also a reminder that letting go of old patterns, no matter how difficult and painful they are, is very challenging to do. If you're trying to let go of an old pattern right now, and you know you need to, but it is excruciating and it's challenging, that's part of the experience. Sometimes you have to keep moving through the difficult journey through to the other side. They were terrified and cried out. 
Verse 13 and 14, Moses answered the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, will, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. Two things that come out of there. Do not be afraid. You know, depending on uh, what search engine you use, you can find that do not be afraid shows up about 365 times in the scripture. And there's a cute little anecdote that says God put that there just so that we could be reminded every day of our life we should not be afraid. I used to read those do not be afraid passages as a command. Like God is commanding you not to be afraid. And as I've grown, I've realized more and more that this is less a command and more a charge of encouragement. Because I'll tell you, if I hold to this idea that do not be afraid when I am full of fear is a command for the righteous, then I end up faith-shaming myself. I must not be a good Christian because I'm afraid. I must not really trust God because I've got some fear and God told me not to be afraid. Or then I run the risk of sp- spiritual hubris, right? Well, I'm not, I'm not afraid. And you're not tapped into your true emotion, to your true identity and space. That in order for us to hear the encouraging, soothing, powerful voice of God that says, do not be afraid, We have to be willing to volley a voice to the divine that says, I'm terrified. What need is there for God to speak, for God to respond if we let him know that everything is fine? It's in our willingness to be vulnerable and say, I don't have this together. I'm unsure and I'm certain and I'm afraid that the powerful, encouraging voice of God speaks It says, don't be afraid. And here's why. Because I'm acting. Because the Lord will fight for you. Because you don't need to see the way forward. You don't need to have the pattern all set. Because I'm already at work. I'm on the job. Right? The psalmist says, he never sleeps nor slumbers. The logic is bigger than our own human logic. The Lord will fight for you. The beauty is that because the Lord works on our behalf, we can be free from having to engineer the outcome, from always having to figure the way forward. We can be free from having to engineer the way forward. And we can be free to receive the gifts that he's doing all the time. And then Moses says, be still. Okay, be still. Well, when I'm in a space where I'm feeling anxious, where I don't know the way forward, I can't keep going on the way it is, it's really tough to be still. When you look up this word in Hebrew, it, it's speaking less and less of our physical action, and it's actually speaking towards our chatter, towards our, our talking. Moses is actually saying, be quiet. Like, stop. I don't know about you, but in those times and spaces where I can't see the way forward, I get a lot of mind chatter, a lot of voices that are telling me what I should do, how I should do it, if I do this, then this, if I don't do that, then that doesn't happen, and it's like I'm 10 conversations ahead, and I'm totally paralyzed. Anyone else have the mind chatter? Here Moses is saying, be quiet. Quiet those voices inside. Do not be afraid. The Lord is fighting for you. Quiet those voices, the voices that are unkind, that endless tape in your mind. And then verse 15. 
Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Like we've already got all that out in the air now. Tell the Israelites to move on, to get going. Doesn't tell them where or how. He just says, get moving. Only when we quiet ourselves enough to rest in the truth that God is always on the job and always at work can we rest our minds and just go to get moving. You see, life is always unfolding. It's not just us having to work in this world. It's not just us trying to figure out the pattern forward. Life is unfolding for us. God provides for us. And God shows us in the times and spaces when we need it the most. The 2000 film Cast Away tells the story of a man named Chuck Nolan who after being stranded on a deserted island, separated from the only existence he knows from his entire life back home, most importantly separated from the love of his life, his fiance Kelly. He goes to great efforts to get off that island, but everything proves to be futile. And so in the film, he resigns himself to the fact that he will die on that island. One day, he goes down to the shore and he discovers a large sheet of plastic that had washed up. Gives him an idea. He takes that sheet of plastic, he fastens it to a raft he created, he waits for the right season, and he sets off. And he uses that sheet of plastic as a sail to get past the breakwater into open water where he's eventually found, rescued, and brought back home to Memphis. Only when he gets back home four years later, the pattern, the way forward, is still as unclear as it was when he first landed on that island. Because the world had moved on without him. His fiance Kelly, thinking that he was dead, got married, had a child. And so Chuck finds himself lost again, stuck again, in the wilderness again, longing for a way forward. And in one of my favorite monologues of this movie, he's sitting with one of his friends and he's recounting his experience and he says, I had power over nothing. That's when this feeling came over me like a warm blanket. I knew that somehow I had to stay alive. I had to keep breathing, even though there was no reason to hope. Logic told me I was going to die on that island. One day, that logic was proven all wrong because the tide came in and it gave me a sail. And now here I am. And I know what I have to do now. I have to keep breathing. Because tomorrow the sun will rise. Who knows what the tide will bring in. This fictional story illuminates the beautiful truth of the divine movement. We are limited in scope. Our imagination goes only so far. We can be frozen and paralyzed. Yet the creative expanse of God is always working and can move and we can move on because the creator is already acting with kindness, with generosity, with love with power. And so some steps for those of you that need steps this morning, some things to think about if you're trying to figure out a way forward is to take inventory. Do I really want to relive an old pattern? Do I really want to keep repeating the same cycle? Take inventory then quiet 
the unkind voices. I found the best way to quiet the unkind voices is to be honest about them, to share them with a friend, to write them in a journal, to paint them on a picture. Not to suppress, but to share those voices so that I'm not alone and I can get that out. Quiet the unkind voices. Listen and then pay attention to the movement of the divine around you. Look for all those signposts that are popping up, giving you what you need in the moment to keep moving and trust the next right step. Pray with me. If only it was clear all the time, God. If only we had a script and knew it from beginning to end, then we could clearly get through the conflict of our own stories. <sighs> but life doesn't work that way. And time and time again, we find ourselves stuck in patterns, in cycles, in rhythms that do not work for us any longer. And we don't always know the way forward. We can't keep going with the way things are and we can't see what's next. God, in this space, then, would you give us the encouragement to cry out to you, to hear your voice reverberate back, do not be afraid to be honest about the mindless, unkind chatter that we experience. And to be able to see all the ways in which you are providing at work. And that we could just take the next right step. For some of us here today, right now, um, we might be in the middle of a broken pattern. We might be really stuck. Actually, maybe no one really even knows it. We've done a good job of masking it. Maybe we're here this morning and we're um, mindful of a loved one or a friend. And our heart is heavy for them. We want to know how to help and yet we, we can't figure it out either. Would you just quietly where you're at? Pray those things. Pray those people. Pray those situations to the creator. As you pray those, would you hear the encouraging, powerful voice of the Almighty that says, you are not alone. I hear you. Do not be afraid because I am on the job. It's not up to you. You don't have to solve it. You don't have to figure it out. This is where I do my work. Take heart. Gracious God, thank you that you are at work. You see a much broader scope. We are yours. Give us the encouragement we need throughout our days to keep moving, to keep going, to keep trusting. We thank you that you call us your own. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Spirit, amen.